Well, hello there beautiful souls and welcome back to my channel. I am so excited to share the beginning of a new painting that I'm working on in, this is January, 2023. I had to think about that for a second. And I wanted to take you through the process of how I've been creating my oil paintings for the past few years. And this is a technique that I've learned from artist Dennis Perrin. Rest in peace, Dennis, he's no longer with us. And I love this technique. It's super simple. It breaks everything down. And I tend to work in layers because some weeks I don't have a full eight hour studio day. Sometimes I come in for an hour. And so this process allows for me to work in layers, to not overthink things. And it's just super simple. And I've been able to exhibit these works all over the world and it's just super satisfying. So I'm excited to share it with you. Before we begin, I am using, behind me you'll see canvases from Blick and these are premium gallery canvases. So they're great quality. I don't stretch my own canvases to save time. Also, I'm really bad at it, so <laughs> we don't wanna see that. And so as you're gonna see, this is about um, maybe 20% into the work. And so far we have the background, we have all the darks and lights put in, as well as starting to build some color. So I'm just gonna put this back here. And so the paint that I'm using in for this specific painting is um, Williamsburg Oils. So I'll show them to you here. And I love this paint, it's really good quality. And I get these sets, so you can get this at any art supply store if you're in the US or something similar, just get professional quality artist paints. So these are just the basic colors. So we have um, permanent um, lizard and crimson, phthalo blue. We have a nice cadmium red, permanent yellow light. We have yellow ochre, raw umber, burnt sienna, viridian, and yeah, so you can always add more, but I recommend, especially if you're starting out, just start with simple colors, the basics, and I'll include those in the show notes for you. And the brushes that I'm using, which I have been using, are the Dennis Perrin Edition, which, you know, I'm a big fan of Dennis Perrin, from Rosemary Brush Co. And my medium to help the oil paint flow smoothly is linseed oil and you can use an artist grade linseed oil. And that's it, and just a little bit of paint thinner to you know, prepare the surface is really what I use. And then I just show up, I make some tea, and I play music, and I get in the flow. So right now, I am working from an image, and I like to sketch for the most part. There are some exceptions, of course, but I like to sketch the thing that I'm painting. So I typically carry a sketchbook with me or I'll take a small uh, study, a small canvas panel, and then I will translate it on a canvas at the studio because I do not have the image that I wanna paint in front of me. So I can't paint from life. And some people swear by only painting from life. I think that's a personal choice given you know, all the tools that we have. But what I will say this, I prefer to print the image that I already sketched that I'm familiar with and I practiced before and bring it with me to the studio instead of having something like an iPad. And the reason is the iPad can be really distracting. And I feel like once we have the image, it creates like a frame and then you're really committed to that specific picture. So those are just my tips. And when possible, learn from my mistakes do paint from your own images, invest in a little point and shoot camera or take, our phones take really great pictures these days. So take images, collect them, create folders on your phone or laptop so that you have inspiration all the time. And this also helps us to become more present and aware. So as we go about our life, um, we will start to notice beauty. We'll start to see a composition that we like. And that's kind of how I do it. So the image that I am working on right now is a picture of my dog um, inside a really beautiful sunroom, which is one of my favorite houses that I love to paint a lot. And you'll see me painting this house over and over and over again, because I'm always discovering something there. And the light there is just oh, chef's kiss. So that is the process. And so how do I create my work? Well, I typically start with 
a canvas. Sometimes I'll tone it, meaning I'll mix like a nice gray, very thin layer of paint and brush it over and wipe it down with the rag. But in this case, I started with a white canvas and I create the underpainting using cadmium red or deep cadmium red. And this helps me map out the composition. So instead of worrying about, you know, every detail that's gonna go into the painting because I'm not a realist painter, I'm more of like an expressionist. I like to map out where all the major parts of the painting are gonna be. And then from that place, I will start building the composition by applying and blocking in the darks, um, preserving the highlights. So I will add in where the brightest parts of the paintings are. And then I will go ahead and start adding the darkest darks then the next tone after that, the next value after that, and then we'll start playing with color and noticing you know, what are the colors within a certain palette that are in the work. So when it's easier to maintain the palette and have that cohesive work when you work with a limited palette. So how do you create a limited palette? Well, you just basically work with the basic color. So it's, Ultramarine blue, phthalo blue, alizarin crimson, cadmium red, white, titanium white. Um, you can add more or less because as you know, from red, blue, and yellow, you can pretty much mix everything you will need to add white to it. So I like to have some other options other than those three colors just because I'm a big fan of color. And so you'll see me going deeper. But in this video, this is the foundation of a painting. So this is how I get started. And then as you continue working, you can add more and more depth, more and more detail. And in cases, if you love color, more and more color. So I hope you enjoy seeing snippets of my process and I look forward to sharing more creations with you soon. And I'm very, very excited to grow with you this year and to show up to this channel which has been a little bit on hold until recently because i was traveling and i got a little overwhelmed but i have lots of exciting things to share with you so i thought i would start by taking you behind the scenes of my studio and showing you how i do things and offer you some tips as well thanks so much for watching i'll see you in the next video i'm also recording a little time lapse as we're doing this so let's go ahead Okay, so I'm going to start with an underpainting using a red. Uh, you can use a cadmium red or a deep cadmium red. And that just helps us to get set up and get into that, you know, see the composition. And this is how I've been working for the past few years. dog and I will share the image with you. So what's important in this process is to, you know, first you can even paint with just your brush. You can start mapping out the areas and I do use, I do like to use a straight edge when I'm painting. So I'll just create my hand and these are for any plumb lines if you're painting interior specifically you want to make sure that you have some you know some lines in there because you, it's pretty tough you can do it you know in art school in Russia they say you have to use your hand but I'm not that talented and I like to use tools that are available to me so so we're gonna get started here I see another little area that I want to... There we go. Let's see here. All right, so now because I have these you know, general lines mapped in, now I can start looking at some bigger shapes. And what we're doing is, and this I learned from Dennis Perrin, one of my mentors from the rest of the piece. And you'll hear some noises. So, what we're doing 
doing is we are mapping. We are creating a map and a drawing. The drawing is just going to tell us where the paint is going to go. So we're not painting right now, we're just drawing with paint. And there's a big difference because we're not adding a ton of paint. This is pretty watered down and even dry. So what I'm doing is I'm finding the shape of my dog. beautiful part about the way that this the way that I work is that you do not need to be a perfectionist about it because you can always go back and you can always fix it and that's perfect for me because I'm not by any means I'm not a perfectionist at all so right, there's a little plant here I'm just gonna map it in and I'm just noticing Noticing the areas that and if you're someone who gets a little bit anxious when you paint, I encourage you to just breathe, remember to breathe, remember to calm yourself and know that being in the moment is exactly the way that we get to that beautiful result. And even taking some time to visualize that art that you want can be really, really helpful. Okay. Now I'm starting to... What the goal is for this technique is to... This is how I like to hold my brush when I'm working with big shapes and angles. The goal is to not see the subject, but see the shapes. So thinking in abstract larger shapes in this kind of technique, there's lots of techniques out there, but in this specific way of working, what we're trying to do is to find those big broad areas and to not necessarily worry about what it is yet until we get to the details, which will come much, much later. If you hear a clicking noise, it's our heater in our building and it makes a clicking noise, so, <laughs> so don't worry about that. Okay, so now I'm continuing, and you see how I didn't even fill up my brush, I'm just using what's on the actual brush because there's still lots of paint to draw with, since we're not painting yet. There's lots of pigment on it, especially red is such a strong pigment. I'm just establishing these shadow areas. This is the shadow from the dog, and you'll see this come together as I'm working. And I'm not someone who's a realist painter, so I don't necessarily measure things, although you can if you have the inclination to get really accurate, which I don't always. Um, and you're going to hear some noises, so I'll try to just paint here in this time. What I like to do is just kind of eyeball everything out, and if something doesn't look right to me, I'll go back in and I will, I will work on it. So start very, very good. The model in this piece is under me as I'm painting, which is very cute. It makes me happy. Okay, so we're just continuing to see what it is that we are trying to capture here. Just to see generally where things are. Find the basic 
dark areas. general direction of the perspective and not worrying about it just yet. Maybe even taking a paper towel and blending it. I said this is a drawing so you can be creative in how you map out your be careful because the paper towel does shed. Things. So, just being aware of that and brushing it off with a brush or your hand. The tooth of the canvas can sometimes create little remnants. And this is also, if you make a mistake, there's no such thing as mistakes, but if you don't like the way something is looking at this stage, you can take a paper towel with a little bit of turpentine and work into it and even, you know, wipe it away. You're not going to get all of it off, but you're going to get a lot. So you can use your creativity to edit as needed. And my intention for this year is to take things slower than I have last year. I felt a little bit rushed last year, so I want to make sure that everything that I do is super intentional and calm and feels really good to me above all else and I believe that everything else will fall into place as I This is an area under the window that's a little bit in the shadow so I want to just indicate that as we're working and so I sort of like kind of wipe away, can I say that? Um, you can go back in and darken some areas that you see are darker. So this is a, an exercise in values. And values are how light or dark something is in relation to the black is black and the white is white that we have available to us. Okay, let's maybe just playing around with some of those lines. I'm not committing to anything yet. This is, remember, this is just a sketch. You don't need to get really detailed. I'm just adding in general areas so I know that this plant here, this little, kind of, looks like a weeping willow to the tree. I know this is going to be darker than the window behind it, so I'm going to go in here and establish all those areas now. And I'll know that later, as the perspective descends into the background, it's going to get lighter. So these things that are in this sunroom that I'm painting are in the shadow. It's going to be darker. And the more you are present, I notice with me, the calmer I am and the more present I am, the easier it is to see things and to notice things. So, an exercise in being present above anything else, which is really what we want for the rest of our life too, right? We want to be super present and we want to be paying attention and enjoying all the moments that God has given us so far, the universe. Dennis Heron has really taught me that and it does work great because 
something beautiful happens once you start adding in the other layers of paint. And you are going to see those pops of red pop through the canvas. And to me, there's something really magical. It almost looks fluorescent pink in some of my paintings, depending on the color combination. When you play with different colors, you'll start to see the way that each color affects the other. And it's really cool. Now the other reason why is because for the underpainting, especially with the technique that we're using that's going to use a lot of layers, uh, technically this is a la prima, but I don't really worry about painting wet on wet all the time. If I have to leave and if I have a meeting or I want to get to the gym before it closes, this technique also works great for dry layers. So yes, it's nice when you can blend the paint when it's wet, um, and you can still do that, but I think like this technique is great for when you have to come back the next day as well. Both work really beautifully in my opinion. And the reason why we're using such thin layers at the beginning is because you want to paint fat over lean. Fat over lean means that the thicker, more oily paint and the texture goes on top of the thinner paint. And when you layer it in this manner, it's going to be archival and it won't crack. Now, if I were to start adding thick layers of paint and then glaze over it later with thin paint, it might create cracks because the thinner layers dry faster than the thicker layers, and it might create cracks. So you want to think about longevity of your work if that's important to you. And if not, then do whatever you want. <laughs> there really are no rules. But it's like if your collectors are worried about the preservation of your work, then I would just be mindful of the way that you're creating. areas on the canvas okay so we're gonna do this for every time we work in this style and I'm just gonna start with Calibre because that's what my soul is calling me to do and this is not painting yet we're still using a pretty thin um, layer of paint here but just mapping out where are the brightest brightest whites and this you know mix in with a little bit of yellow and just seeing those shapes not painting anything yet just identifying those areas of bright light hitting the scene. Okay, so this is little foot. And you'll see this come together as we work. But I'm just trying to find where it hits him so that I can mark it and preserve it. And I don't lose those areas, right? I'm just gonna get a little more here. And when you use a big brush like this, this does help with over, you know, people ask me all the time, how do I stop overworking my art? When you use a bigger brush, it helps you to just focus on those important areas and not worry so much about the details. So 
So once again, I'm just going in, and if it mixes in with a little bit of the red underpainting, that's fine. This is not the final drawing. You can still go back and edit it later, so that's the cool thing. And maybe there are some areas that are a little bit lighter that you want to just mark down that aren't necessarily the bright white. You can do that as well. So that's all we're going to do for now. We're just going to go through ears. Light is hitting the plant over here just so. And hold in here. And that might need a little bit more. So just finding those spots where it's really light that you can preserve or at least mark. You know, you don't you're not necessarily not going to go back through this, but you want to make sure that you know those big shapes because I think it makes for a strong composition when you have those strong shapes already in there. So. probably the brightest part of this painting because the sunroom is constantly flooded with light and even though I marked down some of those trees in the background they're still going to be significantly lighter than other forefronts of the painting so just keep that in mind as you're working. There's a little leaf here and this is not accurate this is just what I've seen. Cool. Alright, a little bit more. I'm liking how this is turning out so far. So my job is to slow down and to focus on one step at a time so I don't feel overwhelmed and I don't feel crazy. And sometimes I get a little too excited and then that's how paintings get ruined. So if I need to pause and go for a coffee or get lunch, that's better than trying to work through it and then losing that magic. Oops. This little highlight here is the sun coming through on this brick floor, and you'll see I'm gonna, I'm just gonna mark it as light, but it's actually a little bit more yellow, like almost tan. Um, as we start working on it, that's gonna come through. So, all good. And now there are these like metal chairs on this porch, and. I'm not going to worry too much about those details yet, but I'm just going to mark down where I see the little legs going for the future. And some of them will be a lot more muted than what's currently there, so I'm just kind of marking the spots. And this wall is drenched in sunlight, so I'm gonna get, make it even brighter eventually, but for now we're just gonna set down where the sun is hitting. All right, so that it gives us an idea of where everything is gonna go, and this is by no means the final place, but what we want is we just wanna know where, you know, where we're gonna be working around, and we wanna preserve the shapes of the painting as we're working. So this shouldn't take too long. We just want to establish those shapes and then we'll work on the rest as we continue. All right guys, I am back on another day and now it is time to put down some of the dark areas of the painting. So just to recap so far, we've created a map, a drawing, and we added the main highlights very general we're not getting into any details but we're kind of just marking down where everything is going to go and now it's time to put the darkest darkest colors um, or our shadow areas so I mix my own black and I do this using um, ultramarine blue I use what else do I use alizarin crimson 
and phthalo green or meridian green. So let me go ahead and mix up so we can get started with our shadows. moment to locate all my paints. <laughs> We're just coming in after a long winter break, so I'm still getting back in the flow. Okay, here's our Viridian. And when we create our own black, I don't think there's actually anything wrong with using any you know pre-made black it just it's a little bit flatter so when you mix your own it gives you a nice deep, deep, deep rich tone. <clears throat> all right the trick is going to be finding my laser and crimson and this might be one of those situations where i may have run out here it is. Okay, it's just a little bit paint splattered. <laughs> so we're gonna squeeze a little bit of our Viridian in here. And at this point, I might start adding a little bit of medium into my painting process. So just a little bit of oil. I'm using linseed oil. Taking a nice palette knife here. And. I'm going to show you what happens and it just it's just a little bit of mixing it's not a lot of effort here for the black and this is I don't even set up my palette until after I create the tone you know because I work sometimes I start and it can only work for a few minutes so I'm going to show you this is our black see how rich it is and this is what we've made using ultramarine blue, alizarin crimson, and either phthalo or viridian green. I think phthalo makes it a little bit darker, but it's really up to you. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to take a nice big brush if you're working on a similar size, and we're just gonna load it up like so. And what this is going to do is this is going to, let's see if I can, so this is going to help us create a poster-like finish, and this is, I also learned this from Dennis Perrin. So if you're using a photograph, you might not be able to spot the shadows as easily. So in that case, you can squint your eyes and start noticing some of those deepest darkest shapes. And if this happens, don't worry, just take a little bit of towel. So we're looking at big shapes at this point. We're not looking for lines or for details. We're looking for where is the darkest, darkest part of our painting. very dark it's kind of it's facing the opposite of the Sun so pretty much all of this front facing planter make sure you have lots of paint on your brush for this process make sure that the whole thing is just loaded because what we're gonna do is we're gonna go in and add the other values the lighter brown and things like that in this composition Doesn't have to be perfect, just looking at those big broad shapes. And this is of course going to get lightened, so don't panic. This is not a black and white painting. This is just one of the ways to handle it. I think blocking shadows is really helpful. And this actually helps prevent overworking too. So for those of you 
wondering about how do I not overwork? And then in here, I'm going to start looking at some smaller black shapes. So there's a lot of leaves and there's going to be a lot of green in this part, but there are some kind of shadows. In there as well. And if you cover too much, don't worry, you can always with oil paint, you can go back and correct it or add whatever you need to add. So don't worry, this is not about perfectionism at all. Okay, okay I see another little shape in here. And to me, it's all about the mood of the work, so I'm not someone who's concerned with super realistic representations, although of course I always like to push myself, but if you're someone who wants to achieve that, don't worry, you'll be able to as well because this technique, you can do a lot. You can keep going for it, okay? But we're going to start with those bigger shapes so we don't feel overwhelmed. And as we work on this, we can always edit more. Great, I'm loving how this is turning out. So if something is working, acknowledge it and give yourself credit because, you know, some, <laughs> it's not always easy to paint, but I think the more we celebrate those little wins and those moments in the process, I think that's truly what matters. Okay, so I'm gonna go, there's a little bit. There's a nice leaf here. And the inside of this plant is in the shadow, so it's pretty darn dark inside of here. And then as you're doing this, I encourage you to also pay attention to the shapes around what you're creating because you might notice that your initial drawing is a little bit off or, you know, the proportions are not as accurate. And that's good because in this early stage, you can acknowledge that and you can actually change it. So... I mean, you can always change it, but it's just easier when you're when you're just putting down the bones. You know what I mean? Great. So now I see my dog Calibri's ear, and he has one black ear, and has the tip of his other ear is a little bit black. Then he has one black spot, which is actually dark gray, but in the shadows here it looks black. And that's not his butt, that's just a spot on his. <laughs> so we'll work through that once we get there. But for now, we just want to map out those darks. Squinting your eyes if necessary. If you feel, if your image has too many details, squint your eyes to help you gain clarity on it. So you're not looking at any details, you're looking at the darkest shapes. You know, and then a helpful tip I learned from a class I took from Grand Central is if you have a hard time identifying the block, uh, blocking shapes, try to find as many animal shapes, especially if you're drawing, and that will help you look for outlines of things instead of what is the image, because the image is going to be overwhelming at first, and we want to break it down into general shapes. That's how we're going to create a strong and fun composition. Great. So, do you see how the shadows are starting to come through? Hopefully you can see. And this is super easy and fun. Don't let this overwhelm you. This should be enjoyable. To me, it's like a puzzle, and it's like putting together a puzzle. I think that's pretty much it for the darkest darks. Now there's going to be some detail areas which we will tackle together in the later stages. For now, I think the important thing is just to map out those big, the big ones that matter. Like I said, you're going to have some areas that you will definitely want to change. The more we look at something, the more will appear to us. So don't worry about. And then you want to clean up this brush because we are not going to need 
this level of blackness for a while until we go back through. So I use a little bit of paint thinner. And then of course paper towels, just regular paper towels. You can use rags or recycle cloths too. That is and I'm gonna set aside my dirty brushes so I can keep my paint nice and crisp. I'm gonna wash them with brush cleaner or dish soap later on as I clean up, but I'm just gonna set that aside here. And I can use it for other things um, as long as I get all the darkness out of it first. And we'll be back to continue the painting.